we looked at what interrupts are. Now we want to look at where they are used. Okay, why are they useful? Okay. So the primary reason that interrupts are useful is for input-output devices. So if you want to read or write from a peripheral device, each device has its own controller, each device is managed by some piece of software, and you want to have the hardware interact with the software in some way. And input-output is normally very slow compared to CPU operation. So you're talking about 10 orders of magnitude, so 10 to the 10. Right? A lot of the cases, CPUs operate at gigahertz scale. Um, you, know, you go to far away devices there, operate at a much slower scale, even possibly once every second. Right? Some I.O. devices are that slow. Okay? Uh, most I.O. devices operate in the millisecond granularity. So if you were to busy wait, then first of all, what is busy waiting? Right? So if, you, if your device is slow in comparison to the time it takes for one CPU operation, um, the CPU operation has the option of waiting. Right? So how does it, what, what does waiting mean? So when it waits, essentially it's going to have a for loop. Right? So it goes there, it contacts the I.O. device. Okay? So this is your I.O. device. And in the meantime, it just sits there pinging your I.O. device. Right? Every cycle or so is going to send um, a message to this one saying, are you ready? Right? So it's going to ask that question. And if the I.O. device is not ready, then it's not useful. And the CPU is going to sit in a tight loop and keep checking the register. Okay. And this is bad. Why? One is a performance loss because all I'm doing there is just checking and the check is going to essentially fail for a really long time. So if something is going to take a second and I check and check every um, one nanosecond, right? that's almost a billion cycles or a billion nanoseconds I've got to wait before the device completes, right? I'm just sitting there spinning, doing nothing, okay, but checking, okay? So this is obviously not possible. If you're, if you're waiting for something short, then it's great, but if you're waiting for an I.O. device, it's most likely not gonna be short. You're looking at at least a million cycles, okay? And busy waiting does not use CPU resources efficiently. That's the first and primary reason, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna be able to use the CPU to execute other applications, other instructions, right? While the I/O operation is outstanding, so the I/O, I've already so think about it. The CPU is there. You've got your I/O device, okay, and you sent it. You sent your uh, whatever task you wanted to send the I/O device, and at some point it's going to come back and say interrupt. The question is, what are you going to do in the meantime? In the meantime, you can do other work. And that is the way, the reason for interrupts to exist. That is the way in which the I.O. device essentially frees up the CPU from uh, having to just pay attention to the I.O. device. The I.O. device says, uh, you go do something else, and when I am ready, I will ping you with uh, uh, an interrupt, and then you can read what, whatever message that I'm send, actually sending you to figure out what to do. Okay? So... Interrupts are the me mechanism by which other modules may interrupt the normal sequence of instructions executed by the processor. They are critical operations for spooling uh, and are even multi-programming. So we spoke about timers, right? So alarm clocks. So if we had one program essentially monopolize the whole device machine on the CPU, um, you can't. Really, you want. You don't want that to happen. Right? You want to be able to vend out. Um, resources in a fair manner. A CPU, if you had only one of it, is a critical resource. And you want to, if there are 100 applications running on it, you want to time multiplex it, right? And, and for 100 seconds, over 100 seconds, I want to give each application, for each of these 100 applications, I want to give one second. Okay, how do I know one second elapse? A CPU can't keep track of that, right? So you have timer interrupts that deal with this. And interrupts also allow the transfer of control between different programs, not just the hardware and the OS, but also you can use software interrupts to get applications to interact with each other. Interrupts are generated by the hardware, so they're asynchronous. When I say asynchronous, it means there's no one sitting there handshaking, waiting for it. You're doing something, at some point it's going to come back and tell you that the interrupt happened. Exceptions, which we'll discuss in a little bit, are synchronous. So they are very different from interrupts. Exceptions, 
when an exception happens, you know precisely where it happened. Interrupts, on the other hand, are asynchronous and hence, by definition, imprecise. You don't know exactly when they happen. Uh, they could be delayed sometimes. They could be handled immediately. They could be handled anywhere. Right? You, ha you have absolutely no idea until you took the interrupt and you saved the state. So, in this case, I'm just giving an idea of some type of interrupts. A keyboard is one thing that I already spoke to you about. Um, that is a signaling that happens normally during read-write operations. Okay, and there are timer expiries, and then there are also hardware failures. So, this is just a figure illustrating uh, the difference between interrupts and busy waiting. Okay, so if you had no interrupts, then what's going to happen is so B1 this releases all sequences of useful work, right? So these are, this actually work. So something useful is happening on the system. So you want to write your I.O. device, and it takes, you know, it takes this much amount of time. Then in the meantime, uh, that's just delay. You know, this device is just waiting. Your CPU is just waiting, okay? On the other hand, if you had interrupts, what's going to happen is that this portion of the CPU waiting is completely eliminated, right? So this portion goes away. Um, this portion gets shifted up. So you go B2 after B1, B3 after B2, so on and so forth. Okay. So if you look back to our example, program essentially executes it until the right instruction. The right instruction sets up the hardware output device. Um, then that instruction leaves the output device controller uh, for processing of the output. The processor continues the execution of the additional instruction, and when the device completes, it finally comes back with an interrupt. Okay. When the interrupt comes back, the currently executing instruction completes, and then the program is interrupted. So you finish what you already started, not the whole, whole program, but just one instruction, and then you break into the, into the program itself. And when it that happens, the program registered state are all saved. Right? And when the interrupt service routine itself completes, when it's done, it's registered in the state of restored, and then the original program continues to execute. Okay. So this is just an example a figure illustrating that, um, the interrupt operation itself. So essentially, the first step is this. This is step one. You initialize the hardware, you start the print job. Uh, and then in the meantime, you're continuing to do other things. The print hardware finishes. So this is step two. Uh, sends the interrupt, and the interrupt completes. Um, and when it completes, it restores. Uh, before it starts in the processing, it starts. It looks at a table called interrupt service routine. So each of these have numbers with them uh, to handle specific types of interrupts. And when it does that. Um, it starts to look at that and then it processes from there. Okay. One of the things that happens during interrupt processing is that first thing is your device issues an interrupt request. Okay. And you gotta think about what runs inside that handler itself because the handler has a lot of different responsibilities. First thing it obviously says is that then it's got to handle whatever interrupt that came in. But it also needs to make sure that if there are any other interrupts pending, that it takes care of them as well. Right? So what happens is the CPU finishes execution of the present instruction. That's the first thing. The GPU checks if there's a pending interrupt. It sends an acknowledgment to the device itself um, so that uh, you're telling the device, yeah, I have taken the interrupt. Right. So you got to make sure the device can do all the things that need it. And then it saves the state onto the stack. So for those of you not familiar with the stack, um, over the next few core, course lectures, we'll actually look at uh, the address space organization, look at what a stack actually is. And then it finally goes the appropriate interrupt service routine to the address register and then proceeds. Okay. And in this case, when the CPU executes the interrupt service routine, the interrupt service routine finishes, the saved state is restored, and then the program is reset to the point to the next instruction, and then the origin program could continue. Um, remember that the time when an interrupt occurs is not known in advance. Okay, how long an interrupt actually runs? No one knows. It could take however long. 
except that when you are running within an interrupt, things are critical. So you hit a keystroke, okay? You want to be able to handle that quickly and get back so that the next keystroke can be handled and the application can get back to what it's doing or you can put it out onto the screen. If you take a really long time, then it seems like the system